Hello, it's Martin from Vaisley Automotive and in this video, as you can probably tell from the title, we are looking at potentially quite a serious topic. I need to start by saying that we sold over 400 i3s at this point and generally speaking they are very reliable vehicles. In the early days some of them could have some software issues which could flag up random errors and when you rebooted the car those went away, but over time, even though they are still occasionally present to this day, they have really kind of disappeared with software updates. So if your car is running the latest version of the software, you really should not have to worry about this. Having said that, there still are occasions where high voltage drivetrain errors pop up and they're usually caused by moisture leading up to corrosion in some of the high voltage wiring. The car and the issue which we will discuss in this video is the complete opposite. The car is long gone, but it's quite an interesting issue, so we thought we would share it with you. Just for context, it was brought to us by a person who wanted to make sure that their car would be looked after by an i3 specialist, and we were not given a hard deadline, so we could fit it into gaps in our usual servicing and preparation schedule. Why am I saying that the problem is unlike all others? Well, the car would happily start going to drive, and even up on the application of accelerator input, you could see the power meter swing into the appropriate position, but the car would not move at all, and all of this was accompanied by horrible noise. <laughs> that means we had to get it up on the ramp to look at what's actually happening, because there were no warnings in the iDrive screen, in the instrument cluster, nor any relevant diagnostics codes once we plugged it into the official BMW ISTA system. Despite this example being from 2013 and having done only about 20,000 miles, we, from our perspective, wanted to see whether this is something which we would see on many i3s going forward. Here we have the two main culprits out of the vehicle. Initially, when we started assessing the situation, we first thought that it's possibly the hub nut bolts not fitting properly, and that would have explained the noise and the combination of the wheels not moving, but the motor still spinning fine, not flagging up any error codes in the process. However, upon close inspection, we concluded that there was nothing wrong with the half shafts and we had to start taking components out one by one to trace the problem. Here we have the quote-unquote gearbox. I'm saying quote-unquote because this is a single speed reduction gear set, so there's not really any clutch or gears to change through. It is just a fixed ratio to change the RPM of the motor to a suitable RPM for the wheels. Once it's out, you can hopefully appreciate the simplicity compared to a combustion engine vehicle because this is absolutely tiny and even for lanky boy like me, I have no issues lifting this up on my own. And this is what we say that an EV is mechanically much simpler than a combustion engine vehicle because even something simple like a 5-speed manual gearbox would be at least kind of 3-4 times the size of, of this unit. If you look very closely, you can see that it is filled with oil, similar to an automatic transmission which has the transmission fluid within it. However, in the case of the i3, the oil is not really user replaceable, so it's not really possible to top it up, but given it's a civil system, you shouldn't really need to. However, I will revisit this topic later in the video, because there's something quite important about that. But moving on, if I rotate it this way, this is essentially the face which is mounted to the electric motor on this side. So we thought maybe the power doesn't get correctly transmitted through the gearbox itself and there's an issue within the gearbox. At the end of the day it's a mechanical component so it can wear out over time. We can do a very simple test and that is to rotate the input shaft and as I'm doing so we can see that the output shafts going to the wheels through the half shafts are rotating as well and we don't notice any abnormalities, everything is super smooth, there is no noise. So we have to dig a bit deeper and we turn our attention to the electric motor itself. But this situation we are in is extremely unusual. The motor itself should be a sealed unit. It's full of diagnostic systems, so if anything goes wrong, it should pop up with an error. The only external connections to the motor are the power, which is fed in through the top here, and connections to the coolant pipes, because the coolant runs around the motor to cool it down during its operation. However, if I turn it slightly towards the camera, you may notice where the problem is. Keep in mind, these two components, so the gearbox and the motor, they share this face and there is a seal running along it and they are bolted together so there should be no ingress into the system whatsoever. However, look closely and you will see that we have got this powdery, almost clay-like substance on the inside. If you work with mechanical systems, alarm bells are probably ringing by this point, and indeed these are very fine metal shavings. 
very difficult to spot at the first glance, but the little teeth which are on the shaft of the gearbox slide into corresponding teeth cutouts in the rotor of the motor itself. It seems like over time the teeth on the receiver or the female part have started eroding away. And now if you look inside, it is pretty much a smooth surface. So now as the motor spins, there's essentially no resistance from the rest of the drivetrain chain because the rotor is just slipping around the input shaft of the gearbox. What do we do about it then? It is unfortunately practically impossible to just replace the rotor of the motor assembly. You have to keep in mind that even though mechanically simple in principle, the tolerances are extremely tight during the manufacturing process, so good luck trying to do something like this by hand. And if we look at the cost of new parts, the gearbox on its own is only about 500 pounds, but the motor we are looking at almost about 5,000 pounds. And that's excluding any labor and fitting the components back in. Considering the age of the vehicle, this is not financially feasible, so we have to look at a different option, and that is using salvaged parts. We helped source the customer a used drive unit online, most likely from a written-off vehicle. The silver lining is that based on our background research, we concluded that the replacement unit only had about 9,000 miles on it, so the owner will now have a newer motor in his i3. Needless to say, regardless of how many checks we do and our best intentions, it's impossible to guarantee the quality of parts. So for repairs like this, it is always done at the owner's risk. But given the price difference is so big compared to the new part, it really does seem like the most appropriate option here. At this point, with essentially all of the drivetrain components out of the car, the reassembly is pretty straightforward, working essentially a section at a time, reinstalling everything piece by piece. While we are here, we take the opportunity to do a couple of things. Number one, replace the gearbox oil. Remember the one which is meant to be a lifetime oil. But despite this gearbox only having the 9,000 miles, there definitely are some tiny metal shavings in the oil. The good thing is, it's cleverly designed with the plug being magnetic, meaning that all of the shavings are attracted to the bottom of the pan and do not circulate around in the oil itself. But it would be really interesting to see a very high mileage example, so a car with over 100,000 miles to see whether maybe changing the oil is actually a good idea. Secondly, like we showed in our previous repair video, the car has somehow escaped recall of the plastic motor mounts so while everything is in pieces, it's very simple to swap it for the newer metal part, which should be a lot more sturdy. Once all the hardware is in, just like with any of these modern cars, the last step should be software coding. The i3 motor has an integrated encoder, or in other words, a position sensor, which tells it which orientation the motor is in, most likely for the purposes of smooth power switching and so on. And there is a calibration process outlined for the sensor in the BMW diagnostic system, and it relies on information stamped into a small plate on the motor housing itself. We looked all over the salvaged unit and there is no information on that plate whatsoever. Similarly, the old motor does not have anything stamped in either. And we looked at tens of our i3 stock cars and none of them have any information down there either. Our guess is that the calibration only needs to be done on brand new virgin units, but these ones which have already been installed in the factory in vehicles which have been in use on the road should be just plug and play. And that's indeed the case here because as we reassembled everything and fired the car up, it booted up and started driving without any problems whatsoever. Of course, we've done a lot of internet digging and we have found that there have been similar issues to this one on the BMW Active E, so the predecessor to the i3, which had a very limited production run, is pretty much a prototype for the i3. However, based on the information we have available, we believe it's the first time something like this has happened on an i3. That begs the question, does that mean that going forward we will see a lot of failing i3 drive units and we should budget for thousands of pounds on end for repairs? So with the parts out, we started examining them in a lot of detail. It's at this point we realized that the motor was manufactured in 2013, like you would expect it to be on a 63-plate vehicle. However, the gearbox had a 2018 date sticker on it. This clearly means that someone was here before and the gearbox had been replaced. We don't exactly know why and how, because the owner acquired the vehicle privately only very recently. Either way, we are confident that the reason the splines wore down was due to improper greasing during the previous installation, 
quite similar to what we read in the active E example mentioned earlier. There you go, a failure only affecting this one particular car and a direct result of poor workmanship. So definitely not a problem you should have to worry about or one we are expecting to see again soon. With that positive message, I think it's a good time to end the video. Like it if you've enjoyed it and thank you very much for watching again. See you in the next one.